the humans call them turrets. The simple human design was something that most people had not even considered as an idea for any of their ships, vessels, machines, or anything of that nature. Sure, there were rotating pieces on a few of our construction vehicles, but that was about all. Many of our vessels had fixed emplacements. Most of our vehicles did too. Whenever the Vitim actually decided to go down towards Earth and introduce themselves to humans, and when I say introduce, I mean in a way that humans would not enjoy, they showed up completely to grab several million slaves and simply leave the planet. They believed the humans were too weak and too, shall we say, subservient to ever fight back. Boy, they were wrong. As they approached, they gave the standard greeting for their people and gave the humans time to collect their folks, say their goodbyes, and report to the landing areas so that they could simply be brought onto the ships. This was usually done in short order as the Vitims decided that they would simply show up with a massive amount of ships. Whether or not these ships were armed was a moot point, as they would simply show up with such force that it would seem impossible to fight against. Until then, every other species that they went to enslave looked at them as gods, and they simply landed the ships, and all their slaves walked on, slithered on, or crawled on, or flew into, without any issue at all. However, when they landed on the human's planet they call Earth, my apologies, as human language is slightly beyond what we can say, as they only have one tongue, so speaking their language is difficult at best. However, as the Vitims came down through the atmosphere, they did not think anything would happen to them. However, what they did not realize is when they sent the message down towards these humans, they didn't know that the humans were going to take it as a challenge. The Vitims gave them almost an entire solar cycle, as in one of the humans' years, to be prepared, and even told them where they would be landing their different ships. Unfortunately for the Vitims, they did not realize that the humans had got ready and started to prepare all their different turrets. These turrets ranged from anything as a simple weapon strapped to the back of one of their pickup trucks to other wheeled vehicles that have turrets built into them purposely so they can mount other weapon systems. There was also the tracked vehicles that had turrets on them with a mix of different weaponry. And what made it even worse was turrets simply got bigger. The humans had recommissioned a few of what they call battleships. These were water-based vessels that had turrets, many, many turrets, with many, many large caliber weapons on them. And they were very, very anxious to put these turrets to use. As the Vitim pierced through the atmosphere, they were greeted with a flurry of ordnance. Mostly missiles were flying up. However, their own point defenses could take care of them fairly easily, most of them anyway. They were surprised that the humans had managed to develop a type of hypersonic missile and others that were almost stealthy, almost. Only about 50% of them would actually get through, those that humans could almost not detect. However, this was not enough to actually stop the Vitim ships, as their massive hull just absorbed all the impact and may have had some repairs needed before it would be able to take off again. But they knew as soon as they got close, they could simply wait for the humans to run out of their missiles, as how many could they possibly have? Well... They would find out that the humans had a lot. 
It was eventually enough to make sure that the Vitim ships would stay on land, even though the point defenses would be able to fire back at many of the in-atmosphere aircraft that were launching this ordnance, and were able to shoot down several. Many of the aircraft were able to stay out of range of the point defense systems so that they could continue to fire at them. However, once the Vitim fighters were launched inside the atmosphere, it became what the humans call a furball. Many of their aircraft were difficult for the Vitims to actually lock onto, and vice versa. So it became almost visual range for everything, except for the main ship. It was more than common enough that a Vitim fighter would simply follow the smoke trail from the ordnance as it was heading in to strike the main body and follow it back to the fighter that launched it. And from there, they would have what the humans call a dogfight. However, I do not understand how canine species would fly. That is beyond my reasoning. However, this was not the issue. The issue was the fact that as soon as the Vitim ships landed, as I should put it that the Vitim ships were almost four kilometers in length, and approximately two and three quarter kilometers wide, and standing about three quarters of a kilometer tall, these massive, massive ships were simply armored transports and very little else. But as they got to the ground, they found out that the humans had another surprise for them. It would be these blasted turrets. Turrets were everywhere. Turrets were everything from on their seaworthy vessels that they had recommissioned with their massive ordnance that simply turned their weapon systems as soon as they got close did not have to turn their vessels as the Vitims would have to do with their ships. Oh no, the turrets simply would alter and then raise up higher and fire this blunt ammunition, ammunition that could not truly be tracked. It could be fired upon, but most of it could not be destroyed before it would strike into the Vitim ships. This was bad enough, but even on the ground, their tracked vehicles had massive weapons that were on these turrets. They would move at a speed that was incomprehensible for a ground-based vehicle that was so heavy, and yet it would simply drive past, firing its turret in different directions for any of the Vitim vessels, any of their land craft, and of course, their main body of the ship. But back to them, there was another surprise. Tracked vehicles that had turrets but had much larger weapons stayed out of visual range and simply raised their barrels high and then would fire in volleys down on the Vitim ships. This was hard enough, along with the sea-based vessels, that it would crack the Vitim hull. The inner hull, once punctured, needed to be repaired and could not get outside the atmosphere until it was, unless you wanted to kill the crew, of course. However, the humans figured out very quickly that if they aimed these massive turrets towards the engine compartment, they would completely paralyze the ship itself. And then we would see other vehicles with turrets. These were either smaller tracked vehicles with turrets that had not only guns, but missiles attached to them and smaller guns too carrying several of the oh, humans inside, but also wheeled vehicles with turrets affixed to them. But that was not surprising as we had figured out that turrets were a main part of the human combat skill. However, what we were not expecting is that humans had figured out how to strap turrets into the back of their vehicles or simply open up an opening at the top of their vehicles, standing up in the center of them as it drove towards them, and that had a sort of makeshift turret, as one of their soldiers, or even civilians, would stand there with a, with a slug-throwing weapon of all things, and still be able to engage the Vitim forces. Though far more advanced, the Vitim ground forces were completely disarrayed as they 
had their weapon systems fixed, even though they used hover technology and were able to maneuver things and not even need more than one person inside each vehicle to make it effective. The fact that every time they tried to move in a way of the ground vehicles that had turrets, they would always get caught up as they would not be able to see the terrain that they were about to slide into on their left and right sides. Even when they went to back up, it was more often than not they would run into a stone, a large boulder, a tree, even a parked vehicle. This slowed them down and made it difficult for them to maneuver in a way that they could fire back. The humans would call these tank destroyers as they looked very similar to a style that they used many, many years prior. However, they got away from it as they desired more turrets. The Vitim forces landed with four vessels. They retreated with one. They warned the humans that they would be back as they had insulted the Vitim military and they would rally their forces and as a galactic law they needed to warn the humans that they were now at war with the Vitim forces and their allies and they would return and return they did. About a decade later, nine years, seven months, and four days later they would return. And when they did, they brought forth many of their capital ships in order to punish the humans. Not only would they enslave the entire population, but they would completely glass their planet as a warning to never, ever face against the Vitim forces again. But what did the Vitims find? The humans had not been slothful in their ten years to wait for their own destruction. No. Instead, they had built many spaceworthy vessels. Many of them were very small, only about 20 meters long by 10 by 10. Others reached almost a kilometer long, and they looked almost as good as one of the Vitim's dreadnoughts. However, there was a distinct difference. The humans on every single one of their ships had strapped turrets after turret onto it. It could be seen on the dorsal, ventral, port, and starboard sides, along with covering its engines, and right in front was always a single fixed cannon, but that was the only fixed cannon. Vitim ships had all their main guns affixed forward and would simply point the ship and fire volley after volley of energy blast towards their enemy and just beat them into submission as many of the ships would simply line up, and this is how most space combat was known to be accomplished. If it wasn't for the volley of energy, they always had backups of missiles in the sides of the hull, usually on the ventral and dorsal sides. The port and starboard sides were usually used for shuttles, transports, and things of that nature. However, the Vitim were not worried about the human ships in front of them as they were clearly outnumbered almost 40 to 1. But the humans, these blasted humans looked at the Vitim ships and when they were told to surrender, the humans responded with nuts. And that was the last thing the Vitims heard before the human dreadnoughts all turned towards the Vitam fleet, the Vitam fleet charged their main guns, realizing that this would be a quick and easy victory, and then the humans blinked out. What? They somehow disappeared, not only from visual sight, but off the sensors, and within a moment later, they reappeared inside the Vitam fleet without even a word, without even a hesitation and something that they didn't think was even possible, as everyone knew that when you jump a ship, when you jump any ship, it takes several minutes for the engines to recharge themselves before you can use any of your weapon systems. But no, the humans did not 
hesitate as all their turrets immediately swung out in all different directions and began to fire and began to tear the Vitim ships apart, aiming at their center more squishy sections, seemingly well aware to target the magazine and also the engines. If you take out the engines, you either destroy the entire ship or you disable it, which they seem to prefer. However, if the Vitim ship even fired a single torpedo out, the human turrets immediately targeted the magazines and began to fire. They seemed to fear those beyond the main guns, as the Vitim ships would have to alter their course, but they were packed in so tight that many of them scrambled to get position and would end up crashing into their own ships. It was an insane, just complete furball in space. And before the Vitim ships even realized what was going on, the smaller human ships had come in and began to dart through the formation, swinging their turrets all different directions, all around, firing, just constantly firing, releasing a salvo of any ordnance they still had. Their point defense cannons from all ships were just blazing away. And many of the Vitim ships began to overheat as they realized that they could not fire at this much. They always had all their cooling set up to take care of the main guns, but the main guns were of no use at this point, as if they fired the main guns, they had more chance of hitting their own ships than they did anything else. As the Vitim ships just began to move themselves into position, the human dreadnoughts began to move themselves around. They seemed to be piloted completely separate from those who used the turrets, as the turrets swayed this way and that, up down, left, right. However, there is no up or down in space. They just flipped around in any direction, targeting the nearest, the farthest, or any Vitim ship. And it wasn't long before the Vitim chain of command ordered a withdrawal, but the humans, as they put it, have no chill left and continued to fire as the Vitims tried to aim their ships so that they could jump out, even if they charged their jump engines, which would still take several minutes to complete because they had drained themselves on the initial jump, the humans would target their engines and take them out of the fight. In many cases, the Vitims were simply dead in space and begging not to be killed. The humans, the humans decided that it would be better to take the Vitim ships than to destroy them. Now, Several million of the Vitim have been held in a prison camp on the human's moon. They are about to be sent back. However, peace talks have not finished with the Vitim and the human. The human are demanding that for the return of several million of their own, that several sectors in every direction be cleared of Vitim forces and their allies, and a peace for the next 500 years be maintained. Whenever the Vitim begin to get, shall we say, aggressive at the idea that the humans would want such an area from them, this would only peel approximately two sectors away from them, but still losing territory was unacceptable to the Vitim. The humans would simply replay the video of the Vitim fleet being torn asunder by those turrets. And all the other species saw was humans with their blasted turrets. Turrets on turrets. And when asked why they would do this in the first place, they simply chuckled saying, More DACA, more better! We still do not understand this phrase, but we have a pretty good idea. One of the other items is that as humans waiting for the peace treaty began to reach out to the universe at large, to different types of species, the Argon, for one, became a very strong trading partner. However, the Argon are known for their abilities to trade and not their abilities to fight as they're extremely good at maintaining their wealth and giving people a good deal. But they were more than interested in trading with the humans as a new trading partner. Who wouldn't be? 
as they are a completely capitalist society. That being said, as the Argon were about to be raided by pirates, they saw two human ships in that convoy raiding to jump. When the pirates brought up the fact that they would immediately shoot all the ships if they decided to run, they went against the human ships and threatened them, saying, you will open your cargo bay or we will just blast you. At this point, the pirates were facing the bow of their ships towards the humans. They didn't think the humans could do anything as they wouldn't be able to turn the bow of their ships for their fixed weapon fast enough to engage the pirates. They didn't understand the humans call some of these Q ships. The Argon didn't know about this either, as suddenly the cargo bays would open up and massive weapons began to fire straight into the face of all the pirates. After seeing one of the pirate vessels be destroyed, all the others tried to get in position to fire on the human ships, but the human ships broke formation and closed their cargo bay. The humans looked like they were running, but they were not running as turrets raised from the ventral and dorsal side and spun around, and the pirate's last transmission roughly translated to, Oh, fuck me sideways. With the introduction of the new species known as human, many old ideas were brought back. In particular, as far as the military was concerned, the idea of putting turrets back on their dreadnoughts. Many of the species had simply gone to stand off weapons and were firing well beyond visual range with their main guns. With this, all you had to do was stack on fixed emplacements on the bow of your ship and simply point your ship in a direction and lay waste to them with a volley after volley of fire. However, the humans had a different idea. As shown in their previous conflict, they would simply do what they call a micro-jump and end up almost exactly in the center of your formation, swinging the turrets and simply firing in every direction. Even if you were lucky enough to fire off several of your missiles, towards them. Their point defense systems would simply swing around just like any other turrets and take out the missiles, or they would misdirect them and they would end up blasting your own ships. This would cause the complete confusion of your own fleet as you tried to maneuver, ending up more often than not crashing into your own ships and then being easy prey for human turrets. And these turrets were nothing to be scoffed at. In fact, many of them could fire through a cruiser or destroyer with a single shot, and in some cases would fire through several ships before being halted by the sheer mass of what they were firing through. That being said, seeing the effectiveness of turrets, many of the other species began to commission new ships that had turrets on them as well. Although most still stuck with the traditional staying at far off distance, they also decided to outfit many of their ships with missile tubes that would be short range, point defense systems, and of course, one or two additional turrets. However, they did not expect the humans to be able to fight like this very often, as their numbers were well beyond that of anyone else. It was a miracle that they actually were able to fight off the invasion from the Vitam back in the day. It had been over ten years now since that battle took place, and the humans had been given their own sectors to rule over, and the humans did so, but did not expand beyond that. Many believed that as soon as they got their territory, they would simply build up their military and expand beyond their points, which they did not. It seemed as though the humans were content, at least for a while, in their small little sectors of space. However, many were planning on taking over this sector as they realized how dangerous the humans could possibly be and they looked forward to taking over each of the colonies one by one. This was a standard military tactic. Go in and take the weakest points first so that you can take authority and power away from the central command. Once you do this, you will cause discourse inside them, showing the general population that they cannot be protected by the central command structure. And then there would be internal strife, and with that, they would become weaker and then become easy prey.
a simple divide and conquer strategy, one that is universal throughout the entirety of the stars. However, the humans never looked at that way. And when meeting humans out in space as they did travel for mostly commerce reasons, you couldn't help but like them. Many were extremely polite. They were not very imposing to look at, although their muscle density was that of solid nightmares compared to the rest of the universe. But most sentient species, after speaking with a human for less than four or five minutes, would realize that these humans were very polite, very well-mannered, and also very funny. It was this way in which they spoke different slangs and idioms, which did not translate. And when they were finally explained, they would be usually met with some sort of strange other slang that would come out from the alien tongues as they tried to pronounce these words. Of course, there are some that are universal, excrement, of course, but the humans have this strange interest in it as they have many different words to explain this. But that was not what made them actually scary. Though they could lift up most crates that took five or six personnel to lift with one hand and simply put the crate on their shoulder and walk normally without hesitation, it is not what made them scary. Everyone believed that they would be less intimidating as more and more of our own space stations and our own ships began to implement the turret system that the humans had brought back into the galactic fold. However, the humans had a few other cards up their sleeves. We didn't know this until one of the other sentient species decided to get froggy and jump. The Triflex, a amphibious species decided to try their luck against a few of the human colonies and believed that they had the ability to fight off the humans' ambush attacks, what they called a blitzkrieg, as they had many, many of their own ships were designed specifically for close quarters combat. This would be able to take down the human dreadnought as no ship could handle that much firepower at one time. And so... They ended up aiming towards a human colony, but what they found surprised them. Nothing. Nothing was on their sensors. Nothing outside the planet except for a few satellites. Nothing was there in space. The vacuum itself was empty. The Triflex decided it would be easy for them to surround the planet and stop any communications, which is what they did. At least, they tried to. As they got closer to the first habitable world, they could hear over their communications a transmission from, they assumed, one of the planets. Attention, attention, approaching vessels. You have entered sovereign human territory. Return back or you will be fired upon. The Triflins laughed at the idea. There was nothing there. What was this empty threat that they were shoving at them? <laughs> asking, what are you going to do? Chuck a rock at us? Or, oh no, you're going to spit from the from your planet and somehow it's going to reach all the way up here. I don't think so. It began to be a whole joke around their fleet. And then again, they had a communication. Attention approaching alien fleet. You have not turned around away from this planet. We know you are receiving our transmission. Turn around and withdraw from this sector immediately. If you do not, this is your final warning, and you will be fired upon. The Triflex again laughed at the idea, as there was still nothing on their scanners, nothing anywhere. Seriously, what are they going to do? They can't reach them from the surface. They haven't even reached lunar orbit yet. And yet, as the Triflex began to get close to the planet, something began to happen. One, two, three, even more ships began to go offline. They couldn't understand, but some reason, even on their own sensors, their own vessels just simply went offline and went adrift. 
they began to scan the vessels and realized that the vessels were completely pierced from different angles. Either they would be hit in the engine compartment and all the engines would cease and all the power would shut down, or they would be shot clean through the bridge and the bridge crew was simply floating now in the vacuum of space if they weren't completely annihilated by whatever had struck them. Then another one went down. And another. All around the exterior, ships went down one after another. They had not struck the core. What the hell was hitting their ships? They couldn't understand it, but they were losing ships with a single strike. How in the hell was this possible? They couldn't figure out what was going on. And then they heard a communication over the radio. We told you to go away. You didn't listen. I'm going to be nice and tell you one last time. Fuck off. Less than a minute later, four, five, six ships went down all of a sudden. The Triflex suddenly started to freak out what the hell was hitting them. They began to scatter in all different directions, taking evasive action. They didn't know what was striking them. They began to fire in all different directions. What the hell was out there? Something had to be out there. They began to take in their ordnance and just launch it in random directions across the different sectors of this space. They aimed it at the moon. They aimed it at the planet. They aimed it into the middle of nowhere and began to fire. Their point defense cannons would spray and pray in different directions, trying to strike something. And then one of the communications officers simply said, What is that? They used their maximum magnification, could barely see small, tiny dots. Small, tiny little synthetic pieces out in the void of space. They used their other magnification to look around and they could see that there were these same small dots, three, four, five of them in a group, all surrounding the Triflex fleet. And then they saw something they really hoped they wouldn't. They saw a small spark come from one of these synthetic pieces. And within two seconds, another one of their ships went dark as it was pierced from stem to stern. The round that had been fired had gone right through the ass end of the ship and had launched right through the cockpit. The Triflex realized what had happened. They had flown right into an ambush, but why couldn't they see them? What the hell had happened? What? Don't humans fight with dreadnoughts and, and jump in? Don't Isn't that their standard tactic? What the hell is going on? And then they saw several other sparks, and another four, five, six ships began to go down. One of them was simply grazed and started screaming into its comms, I'm getting the fuck out of here, and turned back to where it was coming from. Surprisingly, it was never fired on again as it went full burn outside the gravity wells enough to make its jump out. The other ships were very soon to follow except for the main vessel. Maybe it was pride. Maybe it was arrogance. I don't know. But when you wrap arrogance and stupidity in one complete package, something so efficiently stupid was easy prey. As soon as the last of the Triflex fleet had left and the remaining hulks were in space, the stealth patrol ships made their appearance and began scanning all the ships for survivors. They only found 18 survivors. Only 17 would make it back to Triflex space as one was too badly injured and humans could not save it. From that moment on, there was only one human vessel that would ever enter Triflex space ever again. Just one. A simple cargo transport flew to the Triflex closest planet. And they released those that had come into human space. They released them naked as they kicked them out the cargo hold. But with 
some sort of honor. They carried the lost one, the one they could not save, on one of their stretchers, covered by a white sheet, a pristine white sheet, and laid it down with absolute care. Then they loaded their ship, and without another word, left. The last thing the Triflix heard from the humans as they began to spin up their engines to jump, it was a message from the ship's captain that said, Stay out. After the complete debacle of an invasion of one of their colonies, humans decide to band together to try and defend each other. We know this because if you passed any human planet or even got close enough for a sensor sweep, you would find turrets. Well, orbital satellites, but they operate the same. It is the same basic concept as it is very easy to see that weapon systems are pointing out. They are never pointed in. Most of them are in geosynchronous orbit around the planet, forming a strange design so that every single avenue of approach is covered. These humans are paranoid. But then again, considering what's happened throughout their history, who can really blame them? As negotiations were proceeding, many of the outlying areas wanted to make sure they had good commerce with the humans. And it was very common to still see many of the humans bringing in supply ships, freighters, frigates, anything of that nature. However, everyone understood that underneath that veneer was a turret somewhere that was ready to pop out and shoot you. So they were always very careful with them and very polite. Which some would think that the humans would get very arrogant on, but no. The humans, when dealing with other species, were extremely polite, to the point where they would offer up much of their medical equipment just to help others out. If a ship came in that was damaged, they were the first ones to run over with these strange devices. Well, they weren't really devices, more like cases. They call them bags, but it wasn't really a bag because it was hooked around their shoulders. They would immediately flip it on the ground, open it up, and would sprawl out full of medical equipment. Some of it very low-tech, as simple scissors or something they use for what they call stitching. And up to different type of sensors, scanners, and even a small device that will make the chemical compounds they require to repair someone. It was strange to see such a dangerous group be so caring. They took special care when dealing with the young ones. This was very surprising, considering how mean they had been to everyone else. However, it was understood that as long as you were polite to a human, a human would be polite back. That was, unless you got them intoxicated on anything. We found this out the hard way, as we found that humans enjoyed ingesting a toxic substance called ethyl alcohol. This would put them in an odd set of stages, as initially it would make them enjoyable to be around. And then they would get very quiet at the more they drank. And then eventually they would get excessively mean and want to fight with anyone. Most people didn't want to try a human, so they would end up fighting with each other, which usually made a lot of people simply place wagers on who would come out on top. And we found out very quickly, you don't always wager on the biggest one. Though this is common for most of the galactic sentient species, that the biggest one will always win. Not true for humans. In actuality, it was always the small one who could move just a little bit faster and come up and strike the larger one just the right way that's going to put them to the ground. Several times, you'll hear an odd crack as something of their endoskeleton would give way. We took a lot of note from this. We realized that the humans were just as squishy as they looked. Though they may be mean, if we took them on straight up, as in person to person or person to us, it would be a simple matter of actually taking them down. 
as humans were not exactly the largest species out there. In fact, they were barely above mid-level if that was the case. However, they did not seem to push the fact that their muscle density was far above anything anyone else had. And also on several occasions, you would find a human using this strength to aid others in moving equipment if they were having difficulty doing so. This made much of the galactic community confused as we did not understand why the Oregans might want to be hostile to humans. It was strange. They did not border human space, yet for some reason saw humans as a threat. We did not understand they did. It was always common to see an Oregan just hanging about, standing above all the rest as they were very tall and very thin in comparison to the humans. However, they did not have the straight up muscle mass as a human did. And with this, the Oregans watched and helped with the commerce. It was to the point that eventually the humans allowed other ships to enter their space to trade and what other ships saw when they entered human space scared much of them enough that they would never face down the humans. They saw those turrets. What is with you humans and you flippin' turrets? As they surrounded the planet not only at their equator, but also going from the poles. It was strange to see this, a strange cross shape on any planet close to the edge of their own territories, though no one was allowed inside what they call the soul sector at all, not even delegations. It was surmised that inside the soul sector would be just a straight kill zone, so no one wanted to try them. However, the Oregans decided to try something to stop the flow of these turrets. Every single species might have feared their turrets, but what if you could take them offline? It was several years before anyone would realize what was going on. The Oregans had sent a very large ship, in fact their largest freighter that they could possibly put together, and sent it straight towards human territory. It never truly stopped long to refit or anything of that nature, which was odd for a ship that size. Most of them need constant maintenance. And yet it flowed towards the soul sector, jumping constantly in FTL space to different areas, and would simply stop long enough to charge its engines. No one understood this ship, but no one really cared at that point, as peace had finally come back to the galaxy. Well... At least we had thought. The Oregans used a strange type of new FTL jump, which jumped them not only a single sector as most FTLs do, but jumped them several into the Sol sector. And then it went adrift. It sent back a single message, a video feed of what it did, as a way to try and convince the other species that the humans were weaker than they all thought. The ship drifted towards their home planet. Their home planet, as we could see through the video, was surrounded by not only turrets, but massive turrets, ones that could reach out farther than we ever thought possible. The ship, this giant freighter, simply drifted, acting as though it was damaged in some way video that we would find from the human showed that the engines were leaking a different type of color. We figured it was some sort of plasma, but it was unconfirmed what it was as the ship drifted closer and closer to their planet. You could see different type of what the humans call tugs getting close to it, trying to latch onto it, but seemingly every time they did, something would happen to stop the tugs from being able to latch on. And then the Humans did something we did not expect. They had their tugs line up along with at least three of their battleships that we could tell. And then they launched harpoons from turrets and launched them deep into the hull of that freighter, trying desperately to stop it before it got to their home planet. 
as if they did not stop, it would have definitely crashed right into it. And something that large would have caused an ecological disaster that would reach planetary scale. In other words, it would be uninhabitable. Then the humans found something was wrong. The engines of the massive freighter turned on and charged towards the planet within seconds. Every single turret, it did not matter if it was the battleship or if it was the defense satellites, tracked the freighter as it charged towards the planet and just as they began to fire, the freighter itself detonated, radiating a burst of light that blinded every single camera that was watching it. And what they found out as the light dissipated as quickly as it arrived, they could see a strange type of shockwave which was just barely visible as it reached out to each of the cameras and as it reached, they shut off. A small device had been launched out the back of the freighter that had taken video of the actual burst. This little device was transmitting the video feed and you could see almost all the turrets immediately shut down and go adrift. The explosion itself had completely destroyed any ship that had been trying to pull it. The dreadnoughts, the battleships that were holding it, were completely seared on one side, and all but one were ripped to pieces. The Oregans thought that the humans would simply turn on their neighbors and burn through all their resources trying to fight their neighbors, but the Oregans did not understand that humans really do not like it when people try to play them. They did something that everyone was confused on. They went silent. For months, no one heard a peep. No one was allowed in their territory. They simply had a warning given to them to stay out of human territory. It was almost seven months and then an entire human fleet surrounded the Oregon capital. They blinked in with some sort of technology. No one understands why. And it only took a moment before those damn turrets began to turn themselves on any ship that was around the planet and began to blast its way through. The humans had figured out exactly who was in charge of this operation and had completely bypassed every single one of the other species. And those turrets once again showed their devastation. However, the Oregans were slightly prepared. They had already set up ground-based turrets themselves. This massive artillery was actually able to reach up and assault the ships in space. It was the first time that a planet itself had fought back against a ship or a fleet or in this case, an invading armada. The humans must have been shocked as they immediately began to try and reach out far beyond what that gun could do. And then they realized it was more than one. The Oregans were not stupid. Crazy, perhaps, but not stupid. They had prepared for any type of invasion that the humans had shown so far. They had defense satellites set up that would immediately come around the side of the planet and begin firing. However, they were completely underpowered in comparison to anything the humans had brought. Even the human patrol ships were more than enough to take out these satellites. The ground-based cannons, however, that was another story. It surprised us all that the humans did not simply fire down on the planet. They had the weapons to do so. It seemed as though they could take out the cannons without too much problem, but they hesitated. They did not want to fire down on the planet. And it was not until the Oregans released something that the humans did not expect. Several missiles had actually fired up, one of them striking one of the ships, and everyone heard the distress call. Everyone heard the humans screaming through their communications devices how the Oregans had poisoned them. It was some sort of gas that had leaked into their vessel and they were all choking out. Whatever choking out is. With that, humans simply turned their guns towards the planet. 
but they did not fire their main batteries. They fired something else. They fired cylinders down towards the planet. And as soon as they fired this one volley of cylinders, they immediately turned, got away from the gravity well, and blinked away. We would not find out until later what those cylinders were. For the Oregans, there was one thing that they did not want in their atmosphere and that was a high concentration of O3 what the humans call ozone to the Oregans if they wanted to use chemical weapons the humans were not above doing the same thing though they had lost several ships and had to come back to tow a few of their space hulks away those that had not been completely obliterated by the cannons based on the planet. The humans did not ever fire again, and the Oregon homeworld, even though it still survives, will no longer support Oregon life itself. They can never go home. It was not long before humans began to open up relations to other species, those that had not assaulted them in any way, and they began friendly relations once more. However, the human delegation was immediately asked one question. If they had the ability to end the Oregon threat with their chemical weapons, why didn't they immediately use them? The delegation simply looked at each other, almost confused at the question, and simply said, it's against our rules of war, but they used the chemical weapons first. They choked out our people, so we choked them out. Every species looked at each other confused, and then a single delegate asked the humans, wouldn't the biological or chemical agents simply make it a quick and easy victory? The humans looked at each other, and then one pulled out one of his data pads and began typing. And before he was done, he swiped up and a large bunch of papers appeared in front of everyone on their pads or on the holographic display. Well, let me tell you something about the Geneva Convention. And the humans continued their speech about their rules of war and what can and can't be done, at least should or shouldn't be done. And they began to tell us what their concept of total war was. Unrestricted warfare, as they called it. However, as they were making this speech, something else was going on. Another ship had arrived inside the Seoul Sector, this time a bunch of refugees claiming that they were seeking asylum. Being the kind-hearted creatures that they are, the humans welcomed them in and brought them to one of the nearest colonies. Before the delegation had left the rest of the species, four days later, over 97% of that colony was dead, and the rest did not last long. The humans once again sealed their border as they looked into the potential for biological contaminants to be taking out entire planets worth of personnel. And the border, to this day, is not open. Everyone wonders what happens to the humans. Though we can hear their transmissions every once in a while, we never see them. They have simply separated from the galactic community at large. It is now 20 of their years later. Or is it 25? I forget human calendar compared to ours. But everyone wonders, whatever happened to them? Are they still surrounding themselves with protective rings of turrets? But I have to wonder, if it was a biological or chemical attack, are turrets enough? However, it is very well known, extremely well known. Everyone has told this as almost a horror story about a single group of traders that went into human space and only one of their ships returned 
They told us that the humans had warned them to leave, and when they insisted they were there to trade, the humans destroyed every single one of the ships with mechanical precision, except for one. They let the one return with a warning. Stay away, was all they said. We take this warning to heart now, as the last thing we want to face is a pissed off human sitting in a turret. As a whole, it was expected that the galaxy, each sector spanning the entire universe, would be relatively calm. Although simple conflicts would come up between two species, it was expected that things would be relatively stable. However, what they did not realize is that each of the governments, each of the species that reached out amongst the stars began to create alliances, but they did not make alliances with everyone. No, no. They picked and chose who they wanted. Many times this was because of things like certain resources they wanted, or perhaps even the look of that particular species, or in one case, simply because one species king had married another species queen. Whatever the reason, it was not long before everything was right for a single war between two nations, two species, covering barely three sectors of space, began to tear the entire universe apart. As one nation began to fight at the other, the other would call in for reinforcements from their allies one after another and as the allies showed up they realized that as one ally showed up well they were tied in with a treaty with another which tied into another which tied into two more and eventually each side began to draw in different species more and more and more on either side and eventually there was no exact battle line as all the different species that were aligned with each other was like a patchwork quilt across the entire universe. And across the universe, those that were limited to their own sector began to try and hold defense lines. Those that believed they had more firepower began to push across the main lines to try and take as much land and resources as possible. Those that believed they had a technological advantage tried to build their technological ships fast enough while others just pumped out the weakest sort of vessel possible so that they could have quali quantity over quality and this started to tear the universe apart not only that but it started to destroy other species and soon it became a crusade on either side as both sides were claiming that they were the ones who were destined to rule the universe and those that stood against them should fall or be servants to them to be relegated to not just second class, not just third class, but slave class citizens. Those that did not bow down would be destroyed, and both sides took the same stance as they ripped their way through the stars, charging at each other and firing massive volleys of massive armadas, firing massive weapons, burning space itself, as sometimes it would bring enough energy to bear that they would create small supernovas in space, tiny black holes that they didn't realize they were making, and eventually entire sectors of space were untravelable, as they would tear apart entire ships just by getting close. But this was not enough. They began to go into any of the distant species, reaching out amongst the stars for any sort of personnel they could gather, any advantage against the other side, and eventually there was not a single sector, even the home sectors of alien f fleets, that were not unscathed. Entire planets were ravaged and left as hulking chunks of rock, if not covered in volcanic dispersions all over the place, covering the entire surface with magma. Each one was poisoned to the point where even Venus looked like a paradise. And as each of the planets fell, it became 
common for each side to blame each other. It did not matter who fired what ordinance. It did not matter whose ships were in the area. It didn't even matter who owned that planet or what species they had just obliterated from the entire universe. But they blamed each other. It was always the other one's fault. Always. And it was not long before they both began to reach out to the one force in the galaxy they knew that could end this conflict. They both went to the edge of human space. They both sent their envoys. And as the ships came in, they were met with the same audio recording. A simple message from the humans. Stay out. With so much loss of life, so much loss of technology, so many loss of ships, both sides were now getting desperate as they saw that this would come down to a stalemate. And they couldn't abide by that with so many destroyed, so many entire species now gone from the universe. They could not look themselves in the mirror without complete and total victory and say it was worth it. So both of them went in. From different sides of human space, they went in within hours of each other as they knew each side was trying to get favor from the humans. They punched their way through with a single ship. They knew this was the human's way of peace, was a single ship. And as they kept creeping forward to the closest colony they could find, they continued to hear that recording, Stay out which every once in a while would change to go away turn around and go home both sides in desperation had told their envoys that you will not stop until you speak with the humans directly the humans the humans had been busy the humans did not stop with the technology that they had begun to accrue. Not only had they taken two separate fleets, but they had dissected the ships and re-engineered everything. Not quite reverse engineering, but sometimes simple modification to make it better. Along with that, their own technology began to show clear as both ships, within moments of each other, couldn't even send out a distress call as they were both hit with a blast of energy that shut down the entire ship. The engines trying to keep themselves from overloading and exploding immediately shut down everything to include life support and they were adrift in space. As they drifted, they realized something was close by. They couldn't see as most ships don't have windows. And since their sensors didn't work, they just frantically tried to get everything going again. But each of the ships suddenly felt a jolt on the side. A jolt at the closest door they had. And they heard a knocking. Both sides did the same thing, surprisingly. They both went to the door and simply opened it, not even checking to see if the vacuum of space was on the other side. But somebody had knocked on the hatch. Somebody had tapped the door, so they wanted to see who was there. Knock, knock, who was there? It was the humans, and they were not happy. They simply looked at the convoy, and they said, Come with me. They grabbed the ambassadors from both. Without saying another word, as the ambassadors began to start begging and pleading for the humans to help. Oh, there's a war going on. They're trying to kill us. They believe they're the only ones who sur should survive. They're the only ones out there who should be the ones who control everything. And we will be nothing more than slaves to be whipped and beaten and abused by them. The humans didn't seem to care. It didn't matter. Whichever human it was, they had grabbed the envoys and told the others to simply leave. And they would not be told twice. The envoys were both brought to a single space station. They didn't know where. All they knew is that the ships 
that they were in. Though they didn't see much of it, they believed it was a larger ship, but they couldn't tell, had docked inside this space station. The envoys were led down hallways, nondescript hallways. They couldn't read the human language as they were brought down to a room, and within a minute of each other, both of the envoys could see each other and gasped. How the... How did this happen? What the frick is going on? And they were both led into a room where they were both set beside each other at a desk. And as they both protested, the humans in charge simply motioned to the guards. The guards in full battle suits simply reached up and put that huge, massive mechanical hand on each of the envoy's shoulders and didn't have to say anything else as they felt just the slightest bit of pressure squeezing. Now for one of these envoys, calling it a shoulder was a stretch. However, a human walked in. A pressed and dressed suit was what they saw first. The man they saw before him had a very, very trimmed set of facial hair and very straightforward features. He didn't sit down. He simply stood there and looked at the both of them and said, Yeah, we know what's going on. And we don't give a shit. Both envoys were confused and began to talk. But he spoke over them. Listen, we tried to be nice with you folks back in the day. We tried. God help us. We fucking tried. But what did we get for our, our trouble? What do we get? We get shot at. We get invaded. We have people that were well on their way to genocide. Yes, we got the computer logs. We found out that you sent biological and chemical agents. We found out all this sort of shit you tried to get for us. And at first, we didn't know who actually sent the bio agents or we would have killed them all. Now, I want you both to listen and listen very well. We... Do not care about your fucking war. It's your war. It's not ours. We know why you're both here. We scanned your logs before we even brought you here. You were both sent here under almost penalty of death to make sure that you attained our assistance. I want you to take this message back to your people who want nothing more than to acquire slaves. We're human. It's not what we do. So fuck off. And with that, the man turned around in a perfect about face and walked out the door. The security personnel didn't even allow the envoys to speak as he grabbed them both, picked them up, and walked them both side by side down the hallway. As they passed any human, they tried to say something, but the human shot them glances of sheer malice. And as they were brought to a ship, they were both set in the same room, and the ship disembarked. They were kept in that room under sharp supervision, and within just a few of Earth's planetary rotations, they were within range of their forces. The humans must have chosen well because within an hour of each other, one envoy was picked up by his people and the other was picked up by hers. And with that, they finally got a look at the human vessel that had brought them. It wasn't fancy. It wasn't glamorous. It looked like a long tube flattened down, almost what the humans used to call a submarine sandwich. However, it was covered by different stabilizers with a very strong-looking engine towards the back. The ship simply rotated where it was and took off. Not a word was sent from them. And as the envoys got the message to their respective personnel, each side believed there was only one option, a full-out, single battle to decide who would rule the universe. And due to the humans telling them to go away, the largest fleets ever assembled at that point decided to stretch across the galaxy and begin to 
bring an unholy campaign of blood against each other. There was no words, just constant advance from both sides. If one side lost a flank, they didn't even bring more over to try and catch that flank. Instead, the planets were on their own and had to use their own defense systems to hold off an enemy advance. The humans just sat back and watched in sheer abject horror. And it wasn't until something happened a particular event that the humans would deliver another message to them. The war that spanned across the universe was no longer considered a war, but a genocide, as each of the particular factions both decided that any species that would not bow down and be part of their faction did not deserve life. Forget sentience but did not deserve life at all. And they began to go at each of these areas simultaneously with every ship at their disposal, from the smallest little patrol ship to the largest dreadnought they could make. And they began to fight their way across the entirety of the stars, giving absolutely no quarter to any ship they came across. Any ship they even perceived to be an enemy was fired upon with reckless abandon. And what happened? What happens with all wars? You get refugees and you get a lot of them. Many of the species that believed they were either not powerful enough technologically or powerful enough physically to fight either faction ran. However, they could not run to the other side and they could not stay neutral. Each side did not care about neutral sectors at all. Each of these homeworlds was simply burned, either slagged or taken over and its resources stripped. And many of the species, as they ran, realized there was very little choice in which way to turn. And these species, within weeks of each other, all turned to one place that they believed they had the one chance of surviving the best. They went into human-controlled space. It didn't matter at all that they found all those audio messages telling them to get out, stay out, fuck off, or whatever the hell message it was. They simply went in and started broadcasting broadband to say, help us, please, and got no response at all. They headed towards the closest colonies, but it would take a while, given their technology level, to jump into these colonies. In some cases, it would take weeks to get there. But each faction did not want refugees. As far as they were concerned, this was a holy war now. There was only one choice for victory. And it was the death of any of those, not just who opposed, but who stood in any potential opposition. And neutrality was considered opposition. So they decided, fuck it and chased the refugees into human space. And at first, there was no response. Just the simple audio message. Go away. Turn around. Just simple basic English was all they heard. It wasn't long until they started catching up to the refugees. And the refugees, in sheer desperation, began to turn their engines not to 100%, but pushing almost 500% in an attempt to try and jump away or get in sublight speed fast enough that they could stay out of weapons range, getting faster and faster and faster until they got up in the high 90% of FTL. This did not go unnoticed, it seemed, as more messages came out, but these were not the automated message everyone was going for. It was a message sent out from each of the colonies. Each one was different. But they all basically said the same thing. You're invading our territory. Turn back or we'll fire on you. In response, the refugees again cried for help, pleading for the humans to help them out before they were taken. In many cases, one or two ships was all that was left of their species. They begged for human help. They screamed to the stars for help, any assistance at all, as they began to close in towards the outer human colonies. 
and as they saw, the human colonies were indeed covered in satellites. Dozens of satellites. Not only were the planets covered, but their own satellites, their moons, had their own satellites around them. Everyone knew that humans had this love affair with turrets, and any satellite would basically was a floating turret. Even as their sensors screamed that they had been targeted, the refugees again screamed in. All different languages screamed across the stars, Help us, please. And eventually, they did get a response. It was meager at first. A simple shot fired across from an energy weapon in between the refugees and those pursuing them. Maybe it was a ship whipping past in between them, turning its weapons towards the approaching fleet as a warning. Those aliens realized this was a human thing. They always tried to warn you, always tried to scare you away, but they had numbers on their side. They had all the species on both sides. They didn't even know if the other fleet was on the other side of human space, but they believed even their forces were enough to take care of the humans. And finally, a message came across. You have violated sovereign human space. You have 10 seconds to turn around or you will be fired upon. Looking at their sensors, it didn't matter what faction they looked, they didn't see anything. They knew the humans had stealth tech, but given the number of their ships, there was no way the humans would be able to take them all on. They would be found as they figured out what the humans would do, hide in the shadows, in the nebulas, in any type of magnetic sphere that messed up their sensors. And eventually, if that failed, they could simply look out and they would see the humans firing and be able to fire back at them. They believed they could take on the humans. From inside the battleship, it was Admiral Pop who finally gave the order, Fuck it, let's go. And their battle group head out. It wasn't long before every single human battleship, every single battle group, the entire armada was moving in all different directions. It didn't matter if it was from the colonies. It didn't matter if it was from Earth. It didn't matter if it was from one of their own moons. It did not matter, but human ships began to move. But the aliens didn't stop, as they did not see many ships, and those they did see were small patrol craft. What could they possibly do against so many? And then the humans. The humans came into existence. At least that's what it seemed to be. As sensors began to start blaring warning signals, and they started to register these massive ships out in the void of space. The humans had mastered stealth technology well beyond what they had believed even possible. The ship seemed to appear out of nowhere, and right in between the fleeing refugees and the approaching ships. The aliens did not give another word as they charged their weapons, and with that the humans had their answer. These fleets would not withdraw. These fleets would not surrender. And the three words were the last words put out by the human admiral. Fire for effect. Around all human space, it didn't matter if it was a ship, a satellite, a planetary-based weapon system, if it could reach the enemy fleet, it fired in that moment. For a few moments in between that, the enemy fleets did not know what they were actually facing. As projectiles made their way across at somewhere close to the speed of light, they only had a moment to register this. The sensors, most of them, believe these were simple asteroids that they didn't pick up before. But wait, weren't they moving a little fast? And then every single energy weapon fired right behind them and humans set space on fire. And they did not stop. 
they did not halt. Even as both armadas fired into the human vessels, it did not even slow them down. The rate of fire did not even vary for one solitary second as they began to continually fire volley after volley. And they didn't even stop with that. Even though larger cannons took longer to recharge or reload, the smaller cannons began to fire as well. The battleships, the dreadnoughts, the destroyers, the frigates, the corvettes, hell, even the patrol ships began to charge the enemy fleets. Anyone who was a spacefaring vessel got into the fray and gave them a good old-fashioned human fuck you. Within ten hours... Both alien fleets were simply metal floating in space. The humans, true to their nature, sent out craft to try and get any survivors, but there weren't many. The refugees were then rescued and relocated to different space stations, ones that could be adjusted for their own individual biologies and told that, given the chance, humans would return them to their home worlds. However, now humans have a mission. They have a true mission. Even though they had destroyed both armadas, the war would not end here. And with that, it was chosen that the humans would reach out beyond their sector for the first time in over a hundred human years. And they would bring with them not only human compassion for those that have been ravaged by the war, but human rage to those who would kill the innocent over what? A self-inflated ego? Now it is truly time to show the universe why humans love these turrets so much. The fleet headed out within 12 hours. The war itself was over in two days.